Good afternoon, everybody, um, and welcome to the sheep seasonal update for spring 2021. My name is Marion Stark. I am the Regional Agricultural Land Care Facilitator for Local Land Services for the Southeast region of New South Wales, um, also known as the RAL. I um, am based on the South Coast and I work out of the LLS office in Berry. Uh, I'd just like to start with an acknowledgement to country. Uh, so I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting from today. Um, I'm on, um, on Ewan, Ewan land and so I'd like to acknowledge the Darawal people um, of this place um, and also pay my respects to traditional, to, sorry, to elders past, present and emerging. Okay, so today's webinar will feature three separate talks. Matt Leschke will begin by looking at current soil moisture levels, what the BOM is saying and what this means in terms of spring pasture production and what grazing management strategies you might employ to maximise livestock performance this spring. In addition to grazing management, what are some of the other options this spring? Phil Graham will discuss various options, including growing young stuck sorry, excuse me, growing young stock out to heavier weight, bringing in additional mouths via trading and fodder conservation. To finish off, our YAS district vet, Alex Stevens, will provide an animal health update, looking at some of the issues over the last couple of months and what to watch out for this spring. We're aiming to finish the talks by 2 p.m. and then we'll have some time at the end for questions. Before we get into the webinar, let me just run through some housekeeping items. On this slide, you'll see the control panel that should be in the top right of your screen. You can collapse and expand this panel by using the orange arrow button shown there. As the webinar will be recorded, you are muted so we don't get any horrible echoes or feedback sound. So that'll be illustrated as such. At the end of the webinar, there will be question time. If you'd like to ask a question, please type your question into the questions field, shown here, uh, and we'll go through the questions one by one. When asking your questions, please state what area you are from, as the audience is quite diverse, and this will help us in addressing your question. Uh, no, we're not up to that yet. Matt, I'll hand over to you now, please. All right, well, hopefully um, that's come up all right there, Marion. Uh, hopefully. Yep, that should be my first slide. The, uh, yep. Okay. All right. Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. And um, yeah, my name is Matt Lischke. I'm one of the ag advisors with Life Services, uh, normally based out of the Goulburn office, but coming to you from my home office today. Um, as Mary mentioned, I'll, I'll start by giving an overview of current seasonal conditions, um, what soil moisture is doing, what the bomb is saying in terms of spring rainfall. Um, and then I'll touch on how grazing management will be one of the real key things um, in order to really try and extract the most out of um, the big spring that we're, we're looking to have. Um, unfortunately, history tells us or, or shows that often big springs don't translate into, into big returns or, 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 or good performance in our stock um, because of that whole trade-off between pasture quantity and pasture quality. So I'll go into that a little bit and talk about um, you know, how you might target certain paddocks, what stocking rates um, you might need to sort of try and put on. Um, and then I'll then um, go to, to Phil Graham um, and Phil will then look at other strategies um, as, as Marion mentioned. So this year um, we had what you might call a pretty uh, a pretty typical or, or um, um, a pretty sort of uh, traditional uh, winter with with very a very wet winter um, a lot of sort of cold overcast um, pretty bleak sort of uh, weather in the last couple of months and that um, 
that weather certainly wasn't good for, for pasture growth and, and livestock enjoy, didn't enjoy it much either. So, um, Alex, because of the bleak conditions, Alex will actually, you know, a lot of livestock um, health issues popped up and, and Alex will touch on that towards the end of the webinar. Um, but I suppose what, what the wet winter did do, even though it was pretty tough going, is that it, um, it really did fill, fill the system up and, um, and we now, you know, have moved into spring um, with a full profile of soil moisture, which is always um, a good thing this time of the year. So how much moisture is, is actually in the bank, if you like? This screenshot here shows root zone soil moisture levels across the state, um, and this is a screenshot that I took um, about a, a bit bit over a week ago now, um, and and this is actually modelled soil moisture across across the country, and and this is actually available through the BOM website. Um, but what this shows is that, as you can see, with the with the coloured shading there, is that. Excuse me. Soil moisture is above average for for most part of the state heading into spring, especially um, in that in that southeast corner where we are, um, and then in, moving down into Victoria. So all set up for um, you know I guess a, a good spring ahead. Just to confirm that um, we've actually got, uh, as some of you may be aware, a series of soil moisture probes or sensors. That, that span from, um, I guess, bigger in the north right down to uh, delegate in the south. So these are actual physical devices that measure soil moisture in real time. Um, and that information there is, is publicly available on that website shown, which is farmingforecaster.com.au. And all of these dots and, and the squares that you can see on the map are locations across the region where we have these these um, capacitance probes measuring soil moisture and we also at each of these sites have a pasture forecast which is produced by uh, a model called grass grow so i guess the, the key message there is is the physical devices that we've got on the ground are backing up what what the bureau is saying in terms of soil moisture on this website um, you can actually zoom into any one of these these dots or squares on the map to to pull up further information. So the next slide now, which I'll, I'll go to, um, I've just zoomed in by, by way of example, um, the site of Gunning um, near Goulburn. And on the left-hand side of the screen, under the, the probe um, heading, we can see that um, the, these the soil moisture at 10 centimetres, 20 40 and 60, um, all sitting up around about 100% soil moisture. So what that's saying is that basically we have, um, for at least the top um, 60 centimetres or two foot, it, the, the profile is, is basically completely saturated and, and chock a block full of moisture. Moving to the, the right hand um, side of the, the graph, um, and sorry, I've just hit a button and I can't, Sorry, a minute. Sorry, I just hit a, hit a button. I've got to minimise uh, something here. Hopefully that works. Can you still see my slide there, Marion? Yes. Yep. All good. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Sorry about that. Um, just moving to the right-hand side of the graph, this is now the, the pasture forecast, which is um, being produced by the, the computer program GrassGrow. And I don't really have a, a lot of time today to go into, into a lot of detail here, but what this pasture forecast or how to read this is um, we get a, a sort of a three to four month um, snapshot here of of showing how the current pasture conditions um, sit relative to history, and then what what's the likely range in pasture growth and and pasture availability over the next three to four months. And and the key thing to note is it's projected green herbage available. So what you're seeing here just relates to the amount of green material in the paddock. 
So for gunning, um, how we look at these graphs is that the, the shaded areas in the background there, um, those shaded areas show um, what the what the the long term historical range in in pasture availability um, for this time of the year. So the bottom of the of the where the white meets the red, that's the tenth percent of. So what that means is in nine years out of ten, we at least have more than that amount of pasture throughout this period at, at various points um, in that forecast period. Then at the other extreme, the tip of the, the green zone is actually the 90th percentile. And what that's saying is that um, only one year out of 10 do we actually exceed um, the tip of the green zone. And where the green shaded area and the, the, so the orange shaded area meets is, is the median um, or, or the long-term average, if you like. So what's this actually saying? Well, what it shows is that pasture availability for gunning uh, at the start of or at this point in the season, at the start of spring, is actually sitting at around the 90th percentile, um, which is which is obviously um, you know we're sort of sitting in, in record sort of territory, um, well above average. And based on and the projection lines then show the red, the um, yellow, and the blue lines are then pasture projections or, or what we can expect to see um, based on the long range um, historical. Um, weather data for this particular location and and what that's really showing is that even if the tap was to be turned off um, which is the red line um, we would still end up getting uh, I guess an average spring um, but going by what the bomb's saying um, the chances are that we'll probably end up falling somewhere between the the yellow line and the blue line so it's it's looking. I guess all the all the indications are um, pointing towards a, a pretty big spring ahead. If we then um, fly down to the Monero, um, I've now done a screenshot for Bongabi, and we can see a, a pretty similar story. 100% um, soil moisture, so fully saturated conditions. The pasture outlook again starting spring um, above the 90th percentile this time and a very very positive um, pasture forecast there indeed and an actual fact doesn't matter what site you click on this farming forecast at all basically the, the soil moisture information and the pasture forecast um, or you know it's a pretty pretty similar message no matter which site you click on so that's that sort of is a bit of a quick um, a quick snapshot of soil moisture conditions and what the modelling showing us in terms of pasture supply. I've now got some screenshots here showing what the bomb is saying because um, you know it doesn't matter how much moisture we have at the start of spring, um, we still need we still need rainfall from above, and and thankfully the bomb uh, forecast for spring is also very positive. Um, so the, two, the top two screenshots there are um, showing the um, chances of above average rainfall for the last um, two weeks of September. Um, but as you can see there, it's really, um, you know, this, the, the, the outlook for October is, um, is, quite, is quite phenomenal with the, the eastern two thirds of the country um, all in that really, really dark um, blue sort of shading, which is um, really showing us that or, or indicating that there's a very, very high chance of above average rainfall um, particularly for October and in the last sort of uh, week or so of September. So um, all, all very good news on that front. Um, and I guess the other point there too is that, is that forecast inaccuracy, you know, while it does fluctuate a bit throughout the year, forecast inaccuracy during spring um, tends to be quite high. All right, so um, moving on now, um, one of the challenges when we hit spring um, is managing this this flush of green feed, and it was a real ch challenge last year, um, and it will no doubt be a challenge again this spring. Ideally, it, it's really going to be impossible to to manage um, or manage even a large proportion of of your your property um, in terms of in terms of the amount of feed you're going to be able to grow, uh, or the feed you will grow, and, and particularly, I guess, given the way that the stock numbers uh, are down a bit um, for, for many. Um, so 
um, this means it's, it's really going to be important um, to really try and target um, certain paddocks and, and, and prioritise certain paddocks to try and maximise um, maximise the value out of this this big bulk of feed that's coming. Um, so what what paddocks might you target? Um, the, the paddocks that the, I guess this is a bit of a list here. The things that that, that I think are important to consider. Um, the first being pasture quality. So you're really wanting to target paddocks that go into spring that are, that have been well grazed through the year, that are that are well grazed, that are quite short, um, relatively speaking, uh, and have a high quality, a high proportion of of um, high quality green feed with with not a lot of dead material through them, um, and also ideally you want some some reasonable legume content in those pastures as well because we know just how important legume content is in terms of driving um, livestock production. The second bullet point there is that um, in addition to targeting paddocks that are, that are, that are well grazed and, and a high quality, we also ideally want to try and target paddocks that, um, that may be paddocks that were let go last spring and but those but the paddocks that you've been able to since get get back on top of um and, and the reason being is that um i guess if you're in this situation last year where you prioritize some paddocks and, and others just got away from you the ones that got away you really want to try and target some of those this year just to mix things up a little bit um because the problem is is if you keep targeting the same paddocks and the same paddocks are let, let go year in year out um, the the I guess the the issue there is that over time that can have a real um, negative impact on on the amount of legume or clover content uh, through that pasture because you know legumes like to be grazed during spring it helps with with flowering um, and seed set and those paddocks also uh, legumes also like well grazed um, and open conditions in autumn time um, during during that sort of germination uh, period. So trying to mix trying to mix things up a bit there. Also, um, you know, targeting paddocks that are lower in the landscape, paddocks that have you know maybe better soil type that you know are going to hang on longer into spring, because that obviously they're paddocks that you'll be able to squeeze a bit more out of um, for, for longer. And um, you know, bushfire risk is also a key consideration. No, no doubt you'll have paddocks that you want to really try and um, manage this spring from from bushfire risk perspective. Um, so what, what does this, this sort of um, look like? This, this graph here is, is from the ProGraze manual. So those of you that have, have done ProGraze will be familiar with this. Um, what, what generally happens is we have, when we come out of winter, and pastures are generally um, quite, you know, very high quality, but, but um, the quantities is generally limiting. So quite short but high quality coming out of winter. Um, and then we go through this rapid growth phase in spring where we have um, you know, good high growth rates, high pasture quality. Um, and then as spring progresses, as you can see in the, in the little um, plant sort of picture in the background, as we go through spring, it gets to a point where plants will then move into a reproductive phase and they'll, they'll flower and set seed. And, and when we start to see seed heads, um, that's, that's an indication that um, pasture qu quality, so energy and protein content, um, really does start to drop off and, and so too livestock performance. So uh, the key here is to really try, as, as best you can, to try and keep pastures in that phase two period or window for as long as possible. And, and the figures there, or a rough guide is, trying to keep pastures between 800 kilos and, and 3,000 kilos of dry matter per hectare. Um, and there's, there's, some, there's some heights there if you're not really familiar with that, that sort of language. Um, but what we're really trying to do is, is target key paddocks um, and use stocking rate or, or grazing pressure to try and keep a lid on the pasture and keep it in that phase two for as long as possible because by doing that, um, that will maintain or, or um, that will yeah, maintain pasture quality um, for, for as long as possible in, in spring and therefore translate into better livestock performance. So here now, um, I've, there's a fo some photos here of what this sort of looks like in the field. Um, you know, this, this ideal target range um, 
of between say five and ten centimeters, um, which is about 14, 1500 kilos through to about two and a half um, tons per hectare. Um, this is a photo of, of quite a dense Michaelina uh, or native pasture, um, and it just I took some measurements and basically the tip of the toe on my boot is about five centimeters or 1400 kilos, and halfway up the elastic measures at about 2200 kilos, which is sort of in that 10 centimeter um, sort of height. So that's that's really the range that we're trying to operate in for as, as long as we as long as possible moving into spring. Um, and, and I guess I, I certainly wouldn't be afraid to be operating at the lower end of that range um, at this point of, of, of spring, you know, in September, because if pastures get away from you now uh, or in the next couple of weeks, they'll build up that much, um, such a big head of steam that you, you really will be uh, impossible to, to peg back. So what what sort of stocking rate might I need to 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 try and you know put a bit of grazing pressure or try and keep keep that pressure on pastures? This table here, um, I've I guess at the end of the day, it's really about trying to match pasture growth rate with with what the stock are consuming. Um, and so to do that, I've I've put here um, some, some suggested pasture growth rates for both September and October. Um, and for, for different elevations, so 40 kilos a day in September and 60 for October, if, if you've got country around that five to 600 metres elevation. Um, but I've also, you know, recognising that there's, there's a lot of variation across this part of the world in terms of altitude and, and such a, you know, what, what impact that has on growth. So um, you can see that the growth rates for September and October have just been revised back a bit uh, because of that altitude effect. So there's some, some rough growth rates that you could use um, to, to sort of to do, do your sums on. And then the, the second half of the table, I've just listed here different stocking rates in terms of um, sheep per hectare that's actually needed to balance uh, balance the pasture growth. So if we're trying to, trying to uh, balance pasture growth in September of 40 and we've got um, a mob of merino ewes with singles, we're basically looking at a stocking rate of 16 ewes to the hectare. Um, and in October, that moves up to 24 um, ewes to the hectare. So um, these are just, um, some rough rough rules of thumb, um, but, but I think are a really good um, starting point in terms of if you're trying to work out what sort of stocking rate you might need um, as spring progresses. There's also some, some figures down there for, for crossbred ewes um, with singles and twins. Um, as well as weaners and hoggets, so more of that sort of yearling, yearling sort of age stock. Now, just before I move on, just note that the figures in this table uh, with, the, with the lactating stock, I've assumed a mid-August lambing, um, and I've also assumed that paddocks, the growth rates, the pasture growth rates that I've put down there, uh, assume that these paddocks are of good, good fertility with no major nutrient deficiencies. If you're dealing with country that's that's of fairly low fertility, um, country that hasn't seen much fertilizer over the years, you could you could sort of cut those growth rates and the and the stocking rates um, in, in, in roughly by in, roughly by a factor of half. Here's an example of um, what this might look like in practice. So um, this is a paddock near Yass uh, that's been been well grazed uh, throughout the year, um, and, and as you can see, is is, is still fairly fairly short, um, but but high quality material. And with this paddock, um, lambing commenced on the first of August. Um, so these merino ewes started lambing on the first of August, uh, which means that they're basically finished lambing now. Um, and this paddock's been stocked at a stocking rate of eight ewes to the hectare. Um, the paddock measured 1,200 kilograms of dry matter at the start of spring. So what the next slide now shows is what this paddock um, might look like going ahead um, with, with, with the current stocking rate um, and then how we might up the stocking rate to, to try and keep this pasture in in that phase two uh, and, and, keep, and thereby keep pasture quality higher. So 
this is a this is a, a fairly um back of the envelope sort of fodder budget. But um, what I'm showing here is the current stocking rate of eight ewes to the hectare plus plus their lambs. Um, if we assume that growth rate of 40 kilos for September, um, at that stocking rate of eight to the hectare, if if we started September at 1,200 kilos, we finish September at 1,800 kilos, which is still uh, a pretty good result. You know, it hasn't it hasn't um, it hasn't blown out too much. Um, and then at the end of September, you know, once once the lambs have been marked and mothered back up again, that could be a real opportune time to to sort of drop paddocks out and combine mobs to really increase the grazing pressure and, and just try and um, keep keep the pasture quality high. So the second line there is for October, we can see that we've actually upped the stocking rate to 20 use and their lambs per hectare, which is which is more than double uh, the stocking rate. But you can see that if we assume a, a pasture growth rate of 60 um, for October, which which I think you know with the way the bombs bombs forecast is looking, I think that's that's well certainly um, achievable. Even at that high stocking rate of 20 to the hectare, we can see that the pasture still is going forwards. Um, it's gone from 1800 to, to 2100. So it just really highlights the amount of grazing pressure that's required during spring uh, when conditions are ideal for growth. Um, uh, I guess we've, I've spent a fair bit of time just then talking about um, like lambing ewes and managing those lambing paddocks. Um, the other thing that really, I guess we need to be conscious of and not forget about is, is managing um, the weaners. Um, that, that's really the next the next uh, stage along the production line. So um, it's really important to be thinking ahead with, with weaners and paddock preparation. Um, the first point there is the weaner paddocks, they will need to be grazed in spring to keep pasture uh, pasture down and to keep that quality up. Um, but but in doing that, be, be careful in what stock you're going to use. Um, cattle are best um, because, of, because of the, the worm issue. Um, but if you haven't got access to cattle, the, the next best option would be um, grazing those, those weaner paddocks with, with weathers um, or, 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 or those, those sort of you know, 12 month old um, yearling sort of stock. Um, but, but making sure that you, you drench and, and keep an eye on worms because you really want those weaner paddocks to be um, quite low in terms of worm burden um, when they, when they, they weaned onto those paddocks. Um, the next, the third point there is that weaners, will get, weaners um, one of the challenges, I guess, once once we wean is keeping those weaners going in a positive direction. And, um, you know, there'll, there'll be a lot of food around once we occurs, but, um, but once that green pick, um, that high quality green pick disappears, it will still be really important to put to put a supplement out to keep those lambs going um, in a in a forward direction and um, to really to really sort of pick that point up down the bottom there in, in the green box is that I think one of the one of the risks in years like this um, is that we might forget about imprint feeding. Um, you know, in tough springs, it's something we it's something that's at front of mind because we know that. As soon as they're weaned, they're going to be. We're going to have the feed cart out. But in years like this, when there's a lot of pasture around, um, I think there's a real risk that we we forget about imprint feeding. Um, but definitely, you know, I really stress that that is still a very important um, part of of the program, because yes, there'll be a lot of feed, but it's the quality is that's going to be the issue. And um, and those lambs, like I said, once that bit of green pick disappears, um, they will need a supplement to keep them going going forward in a, in, a, in a positive direction. All right, and just the last couple of slides here, and, and this is just a, a nice fence line um, example here, which really, I, I guess, um, highlights a bit of a, a message around grazing management and what, the, and what effect that can have on your pasture, um, you know, well, well ahead into the future. So here's, here's a fence line, um, a fence line photo, and the paddock on the left was crash grazed in December last year. So, like, as you as you would you know as you can remember, last year was a big spring, um, and and we grew a lot of material. Um, this paddock on the left was crash grazed 
at the end of spring um, to really reduce uh, and remove a lot of that material. Um, the paddock on the right hand side was not crash grazed. We then come around to February uh, this year and we can just see the, um, the impact that had. So the paddock on the left that was crash grazed is nice and open, ready for the, the autumn rains um, or the autumn break. The paddock on the right hand side is um has, has because it didn't get that crash grace has a lot of um a big standing burden of of old dead material um and we tried to then crash graze that old dead material out um in february and we had 500 weathers on seven hectares um but because we'd had a bit of rain um the the weathers were more interested in trying to forage around for the bit of green pick underneath and they, they certainly weren't interested in the old dead low quality material so um yeah the, the the crash graze wasn't overly successful and then if we fast forward to um middle of the year we can see that the paddock on the right hand side still uh, has a lot of that um a lot of that old dead material still hanging around uh, it's amazing how long it takes to break down so I guess the message there really is, is, is the paddocks that you put a bit of time into this spring um, and the ones that are able to keep under control, they'll be the paddocks that are, that are better positioned going forward in terms of um, making benefit of any summer rainfall we might get, um, but also you know looking ahead into, into next autumn on, on the break as well. Thanks for, thanks for that. I'll, um, I'll pass over to you now, Phil. Does that come up okay, uh, Matt? Yes, it has, Phil. Thank you. Thank you. Um, look, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Phil Graham. Um, for those who don't know me, uh, someone who's been around raising industry on the Southern Tablelands for about 40 years. Um, just following on from Matt. Um, what I've done is, um, to some degree, I've taken what Matt was talking about, and this is this is uh, uh, similar to what Matt showed off farming forecast to say the dotted lines you'll see there uh, where you'd expect historically green food to be. So I did this on the 5th of September. This was done for the Murrum Bateman side. Um, 25. 50, 75, 90% of, as we talked about. And then I, what, I, what, what I want you to focus on, though, is the blue and red line. The blue line is the median line that farming forecast to give. So the forecast is that we can 50% chance of being better than that, 50% chance of being less than that. What I did with the red line is double stocking rate, or put it another way, I've just gone and put all the stock on half the property. And that's the impact, and I've done that right on the 5th of September. That's the impact putting half all your stock on half the property has done verbiage mass. It moved it down a bit, but it hasn't moved it down that much. That's less than 500 kilos. It's just an indication how how robust our season is. And bear in mind what Matt said um, that if the bomb forecast, the bomb forecast suggesting we won't get median, we'll be above median. Another way of um, assessing this um, data is what happens to ground cover. So the, the green lines here is sort of the ground cover picture over 30 potential years if we have our normal stocking rate. So what's it saying is there's a 100% chance that the ground cover will be better than 75%. Treat these numbers down here, ground cover as percentages. This one, the bluey one, is what might the ground cover be if we're running all the stock on half the property? Now, we use years that have been before, and the chances are that year was 206. If we got 206's spring on top of how things were at the at the end of at the start of February, we could end up back at that territory if we doubled our stocking rate. Now, 
that might have been 206, that might have been 203, it'd be, and it'd be in there 2017, 2018. They'd be the ones that sort of make up those numbers. But bombs sort of suggesting where the likelihood is we're going to get years like that. So even if we double stocking rate on our property, that part of the place where we're running a double stocking rate, we've still got very good ground cover. So um, neither issue is a problem. We have the capacity to stop stocking numbers uh, or stocking density because our ability to have stocking number across the whole property is, is very remote. Then what might be some of our options? First one, can we put more weight on existing stock? Uh, I'll talk about trading units, about high and silage, and I'll talk about the do nothing option. So putting weight on, on existing stock, um, what's the risk there? Um, I suppose the risk is this, that the market's going to drop um, more than the extra weight you put on. So hey, hey, Phil. those chances in it. Phil, sorry, it's Marion here. Just, um, can I just suggest maybe you turn your camera off? The sound's just getting a bit muffled. Um, I don't know if it's to do with your bandwidth. So, um, do you mind if we just turn your camera off and try to see if that? Sorry, oh, yeah. have I messed it up? You're right. Uh, mm. Hang on, I don't know what's happened. Maybe that was not a good suggestion. Matt, have you got any ideas? Sorry about that. Phil, maybe you turned your screen off rather than your camera off. There we go. Oh, there we go. There we go. Yep, that's it. Let's try that. Thanks, right. Phil. Thank yep. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Um, um, yeah. So the risk is that 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 the market will drop more than we put on weight. So therefore, we don't make any more dollars. But picking up what Matt said and those pictures, which were from the Lagan sites, very important. Even if your dollar value per head was the same by keeping those stock on, putting more weight on, but there's the drop in value, for the overall business, you will pick a dollar benefit up because if you've taken a bit more pasture out of the system and have less carryover mass, you're going to get better pasture production in, in 2022, right? So we've got to think ahead. So if we're selling, if we are we going to sell suckers or wean or lambs or, or wean lambs and take them out to heavier weights? I know that's certainly something producers are talking about. Um, yes, it's it's about putting on the weight, which I talked about. Just bear in mind that there are some animal husbandry costs you need to consider as well, and there can be some deaths. The one thing which Matt was talking about, and I think is the key message out of today's talk from a, a production point of view you're going to have to apply good management and by that I'm talking about keeping pasture quality as high as you can for as long as you can to achieve good good weight gains. So if you're going to take these animals through to heavier weights, they've got to be on food where they are putting on weight. There is If, if you're going to do nothing, you'd be better to get the animals off early. If you're going to keep them on and just let them run on cardboard and they're not putting the weight on, it was a bit of a dumb decision. Now, here are some uh, meat prices, mutton and um, lamb prices for four years, 17 through to 20, 2020. Um, and this is how the prices change within the year. So the average price is right down the bottom. So how do you how do you sort of um, interpret these? And let's look at the let's look at the lamb prices. Um, you know, the highest price in 2020 was in the month of March and the lowest price was in the month of September. So that means that in September, the price received on average for the month was 86% of the average. So what you're looking at in some of these, if you were going to sell, sell your stock um, in late spring, you're sort of looking at, well, how much does it change between late spring and uh, um, late summer or early March if I take the animals through? There's no clear message between the years. Um, it bounces round. But these, if you look at them at your own time, I think this will be up on the, the website you can go back to. Um, you can get some idea of what's the potential drop off in, in price and therefore you can weigh up uh, how much weight I've got to put on to offset any poten potential price drop. But as I said before, bear in mind that keeping, um, even if your dollar return is the same, um, you get a benefit from pasture production. I might just say to 
some of the presenters, you might go on mute. I'm getting a lot of feedback. Um, uh, what if we take on some extra trading units? Now, given the current prices, uh, and I've sat down and done the sums, and this applies to both sheep and cattle, there is still a profit to be made from trades, but the reality is it's a lot harder to find the right stock within a reasonable distance. And if, if you've got to pull stock from too far, so if you're suddenly pulling them 1,500 kilometres, um, that starts chewing into what the potential return is. Um, so there is there are profitable trades possible in both sheep and cattle, but it's just harder to find them. And again, one of the most critical factors if you decide to trade is you have to have your pastures such that when you get those animals back on your place, you have good weight gains. I'm certainly aware of people who traded steers last year, came back, put them on dry food, just did not get the weight gains. And a trade makes money if you are putting on weight. A trade does not make money if the stock is standing still or going backwards. And there's no doubt about it at present with the way the market is, your buy price is going to be above your sale price. I think that's, that's certain. Um, so the heavier the animal you buy, you're buying more kilos where you're going to make a loss. So you've got to put on more weight to offset that loss. So even taking account of that factor, there's still profits to be made, but you've got to be able to put the weight on them. So it comes back again to a lot of the things that Matt was talking about in terms of pasture quality, um, whether it's for your own stock or for any trade stock. Right now, let's go into hay or silage. Um, if you're thinking of, of going down this path and you're doing it to top up drought supplies, to me, that makes perfect sense. Um, but what I would say is don't go overboard in quantity. Um, if I'm setting up a drought stock and I've put six months food away, I think that's, that's a pretty sensible place to be. Um, am I going to put 12 months quantity away? I think that's going overboard. And remember, when you are making hay or silage for a drought reserve, you let's say it's silage, for instance, you're putting it underground, you are effectively putting dollars underground. You could not make that silage and put the dollars in some um, uh, monetary facility, right? So it costs money to make hay and silage. Um, if you make more than you really need, you're putting a lot of money under the ground and what's the return? If you're thinking of making hay this year as a trade, you know, to sell it off to other people, um, I don't think your chances of making money are very good at all. There's a lot of hay around already. Um, prices are starting to soften with, the, with this spring coming up. There's going to be a lot more hay cut again this year, and I wouldn't be at all confident if I was making to sell it that I'm, there's going to be much of a profit in it. And remember, if you're making it and selling it off your property, you are also selling off soil fertility. Those nutrients are going away in that hay and silage. Um, they're not being recycled because they're being fed back through your animals. So that's money disappeared. If you are planning to do hay and silage for yourself, quality of the fodder is critical. And we'll pick up that on the next screen. The other thing I'd say is given the seasonal forecast that Matt showed before, I think it's going to be a very, very difficult year to make a good early quality product. Um, and if I had to take a guess, I think there's going to be a lot of material cut uh, late November into December of pretty dubious quality. And at the end of the day, if we're looking at our property, um, you know, if we, we do something with hay and silage, we might only it might we might only be having an impact on two paddocks of the place so it's not really doing that much for the whole farm but the one positive is that we could get good regrowth after those cuts and that regrowth could become very important so very important for the young moon as matt talked about very important if you're thinking about trading so one of the spin-offs of um, some home silage and the spin-off would come more from silage because it's an earlier cut and the, and the rainfall we got uh, potentially quality food to do something with particular classes of animals. Now, this is the point I wanted to look at about, you know, what the quality and what the impact is. So this is the energy in the fodder, and I'm using a 300 kilo steer as a, as a guide. And the same principle applies regardless of what animal I use as a guide. The numbers just change, the principle the same. So I've done um, two lots of hay up the top here, a six and seven meg, that's megajoules of energy. 
then I've done eight, nine, and ten megs, and I've said, well, that's been a silage, and I've I've put it as a pit silage, hence the costs. And then I've compared that to to grain, and uh, when I pull this slide together, I could have landed uh, barley in the ass for two fifty five dollars a ton. So that's what I've done. Um, and what I've what I how I've done it is I've said, well, we've tried to if we just feed this these various products to an animal, can we get one kilo of weight gain? So if we've got this hay, which costs $100, it's $100 a ton to make, uh, and it tests out at six meg and we feed it to the 300 kilo steer, the best animal performance we're going to get is 0.9 of a kilo, but it's a loss of 0.9 of a kilo, and it's costing us 50 cents to lose 0.9 of a kilo. I think we'll all agree, not a great business decision. If we go to seven meg, same story. The, the, the potential weight gain improves, we're now down to about losing about a quarter of a kilo a, a day and it's costing us 60 cents. It's not till we get to eight meg that the losses start disappearing. Now we can actually get this steer gaining at 0.2, kilo, 0.2 of a kilo a day and that's going to set us back $2.19. If it gets up to nine meg, um, we get weight gain peaking at 0.63 and it's costing us 256. If we get to 10 meg, the steer can put on one kilo weight gain. And the, look at the cost, virtually no difference in our improvement. Quality of the product you're going to cut is important if you're, whoop, I went too early. Can I go back? Now, as I said before, my view is I think there's going to be a lot of this stuff cut this year. Why? Why are we cutting that to have to give us this result? If you are going to cut, you've got to be doing it such that you're producing a product that enables you to put on weight. And if it's even if it's a drought reserve, there is no point cutting a product for a drought reserve if when you feed it to the stock, they lose weight. You've got to have a product when you feed it to stock, they put on weight. And just as a balance, grain would have had to get to $325 a tonne delivered for it for the weight gain to have cost the same. So if the grain was $325, it would have cost us $2.68 to get the kilo weight gain equal to the, the 10 meg silage. Key out of this, if you are going to cut hay and silage, you've got to cut a quality product. Cutting rubbish fodder has never made money for anyone and never will. The do nothing option. Um, you can be exceedingly confident. If you sit back and do nothing and just let your place go, you're not going to change any of your debt stocking densities and the food's just going to go everywhere. I can guarantee you're going to get a poor performance in your stock and you're going to have carryover issues in 2022. I have seen this repeatedly. So I've been, as I said, I've been on the Southern Tablelands since about 1985. Um, 2012, big spring, the worst ever scanning results occurred in the autumn the following year of 2013. Why? Heaps of food everywhere. Everyone thought the years would be fine. They were grazing on cardboard and their weight was, was pathetic. All right. As Matt said, big springs do not equal good animal performance and they do cert they certainly don't equal profits, good profits. So you must manage it. Um, and this that's about increasing stocking densities. And that's what Matt was showing in those fodder budgets, increasing stocking densities, which mean other paddocks are going to be shut up. And what you've got to concentrate on is getting the paddocks right to ensure your stock are performing well and don't worry about the other paddocks. As I said, big springs don't lead to good stock produ production unless you manage it. You're the key to this situation. Your management of your pasture over the next two months is going to determine how your existing stock perform. And if you trade, it will determine how profitable the trade will be. Now, no matter what we've you do, I think we're going to have a lot of carryover food in autumn. And I think, you know, a cool fire burn in autumn is a, is a very sensible strategy. It can get rid of overburden pretty quickly without putting any damage to the pasture. Something we don't use much, but I think, especially seeing we've, we've potentially had two years in a row where a lot, a lot of countries been shot up, uh, shut up, and I think we might need to, to activate something like that. And I've cert certainly seen paddocks this winter who have performed poorly because of the amount of uh, they had from the year before. Just a few general comments, and this is my last slide. Um, wrap silage is expensive. 
It's convenient, but it is expensive. If you're going to do it, only plan that you're going to use that in the first 12 months. Thinking that the wrap silage is going to last for two or three years, sorry, you're kidding yourself. Um, if you're going to make more than what you can use in 12 months, put it underground. And from my experience, 10 to 20% of wrap bales end up being rotten waste, and all that does is increase the cost of the remaining bales you feed out. And if you start looking at the amount, amount of money you've spent wrapping that product up, um, yeah, there, there are a lot better other options around. And moving totally off, um, off pastures and, and not treading on Alex's feet in any way at all, but just from experience, um, last couple of years have been terrible for foot abscess. If they're still hoppy, come early January, sell them. If a ewe hasn't hasn't fixed up by then, it's never going to fix up, and they're just they're just going to create hassles. Uh, the best thing you can do is get them off your place, um, and uh, keep the good sound ones there. Matt, that's it. I'm going to um, um, close my screen and uh, turn my mic off. So all the best. Hopefully that's coming across to you, Alex. Yep, perfect. Thanks, Phil. I'm mute, can't hear you, Alex. Oh, there we go. Now. Okay, good one, thanks. Turn, I'll turn on that too. Um, oh, actually. I'll just try and uh, move. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> we do practices, don't we? And then can't seem to. Just got. Um, sorry, just got to try and move the picture of me off my screen. Um, sorry. to get started so yeah thank you so um yeah well i'm um alex uh but i've been um i'm the district vet here at uh, for yas and borua for the local land services and i'm based at based out of yas um i've I have now about 25 years experience in mixed practice uh, with 10 of those years spent as the district vet, both here at Yass and in Cooma, originally from the Monero, uh, now now here in Yass. Um, my husband manages a cattle and a merino and composite sheep enterprise. Um, and I'm sure uh, many think that he would find many advantages in having a wife as a vet, but I'm sure he also um, thinks that there are, and finds that there are many disadvantages as well, and uh, has to remind me that he doesn't need another um, boss as well. But anyway, I have a special interest in um, both cattle and sheep production and medicine. Uh, so it has been a very long, wet and cold four months. It's been very tough on breeding sheep, and the wet weather has, as Matt suggested, created some very unusual challenges that we don't usually see. I wanted to just provide a short summary and reminder of some of those challenges that we faced and some that we will face in the, in, in the spring. Um, if you like webinar delivery, I hope you've already discovered um, the MLA productivity and profitability webinars, which you can Google. They are really great reminders. Uh, last week there was one on wiener management, which I thought was, was, was great. So before we look at the challenges ahead, I thought I wanted to just quickly look back and share with you some of the disease challenges of the winter and also some of these problems are still ongoing at the moment. Um, I've put this one first as it's it's not that common. Um, we occasionally see it uh, in a few cases every year, but um, we as vets get very excited about it as it's a disease that actually does respond to rapid treatment of the individuals with um, vitamin B or thiamine. Um, in the last three weeks in Yass District, we've had a, seen a significant number of these cases of polio and cephalomalacia, or called P PEM. It's basically the scientific word for, for brain softening. 
Uh, it's caused by a sudden onset of, of vitamin B1 or thiamine deficiency. Uh, and it is very unfair and annoying that we have diseases which kill because conditions are too good, but that's the case with this one in very high sulphur and carbohydrate rich environments. An enzyme sets up in the rumen which destroys the B, the thiamine or B vitamin and re results in this sudden onset brain damage. Um, so just keep an eye out for them. The signs are really sudden onset brain damage. So they're behaving like they've got a really severe headache, often called stargazing because of the characteristic posture that um, this sheep is showing. Uh, but they also can stand with their head hanging low or even head pressing um, and to, to separate from the mob and they will progress on to death if they're not treated, but they respond well to treatment. Uh, another disease that we've been seeing on uh, multiple properties in the last month have been abortions due to the bacteria Listeria. Um, so the right thing to do if you're being faced with a shower of uh, early dead lambs or abortions is to get the vet involved as soon as possible. So put on gloves and bag up the lambs and the fetal membranes as fresh as possible and put them in your fridge. Um, blame me when people argue about that, but with all reproductive losses, you need to call the vet as soon as you think there's a problem. And whether that be at scanning or with signs of abortion staining on a uh, breach staining or at landmarking. Um, a diagnosis can be obtained uh, from the fetus by taking um, so from doing a postmortem on the fetus or by taking bloods from the ewes to show what diseases they've been recently exposed to. So these recent um, dramatic cases were caused by Listeria, which is a bacteria which proliferates in rotting vegetation. So again, another unfair advantage and unusual consequence of this wet year. So more relevant ongoing, there is growing awareness of Campylobacter uh, and its role in early fetal embryonic loss Australia-wide. Serological testing, so testing of the ewes, uh, has shown this disease to be very prevalent in this district. It's not a cheap vaccine, but the cost of it, uh, of um, Vibrio-Vac, is the cost of it equates to around about 1% extra lambs. And it's thought that it at least does this, it, 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 um, that you're going to get those background losses and it's going to protect against that, as well as protecting against abortion storms. So anyone confinement feeding or working with um, composites, crossbreds for lambs alone will most likely benefit from this vaccination. Um, another one causing background level losses is toxoplasma, but um, you know that's caused by feeding contaminated feed, which we don't tend to do, but it is also caused by feral cat problems, which can be a problem in our area. Um, so we definitely saw problems with winter scour worms, a lot of mixed, uh, of mixed worm burdens, uh, and I really think this is going to be a problem ongoing into the spring. So black scale worm and brown stomach worm, um, and this is despite pre-lambing drenching. Uh, it was mostly seen in our autumn lambing situations where the lambs were not weaned and stayed on their mums. Uh, so there's a lot more worm pressure in this system and pastures built up heavy worm, egg and larvae contamination. And of course it built up a lot faster where sheep were grazing short, green, moist pig. Uh, increased pasture contaminations, you know, are also probably a result of a post-drought situation where we've got less weathers in the system uh, and also where people are joining use for three lands in two years, there's a lot more pressure, worm pressure on that system. Um, and of course, pasture conditions have been moist and wet and, you know, great and short and green and that, that, that's a lot of stress on the system. So parasitic disease uh, is long recognised as an important cause of diarrhoea in sheep, but other um, bacterial causes um, are also more likely when sheep are under stress and that basically the weather conditions created that stress. This year we had cases of Yersinia. Uh, Yersinia are a bacteria that live in the gut in low levels but with stress and the right environmental conditions, that's cold and wet, um, and particularly when they're grazing close to the ground, the numbers of this bacteria can increase quickly and the number of ill thrifty individuals and deaths increase quickly. So generally the parasitic scours saw a fast turnaround um, in the condition of the lambs, you know, almost immediately after drenching, 
Um, some of the bacterial scales also responded well just to drenching, but uh, others required additional antibiotic treatment through the vet. Um, so yeah, this is like um, one of those comedians doing an Instagram picture of uh, what lambing's meant to look like versus the harsh reality. But um, the unrelenting wind and wet weather conditions um, caused extreme wind chill for many weeks. It caused uh, a lot of lamb losses, particularly in twin and triplet lambs, and it also caused um, weight loss in the ewes. Um, uh, and you know, in some circumstances where we went out to these uh, preg tox cases that, that people were trying to keep the weight off the ewes, but in actual fact they were, you know, not getting enough to eat. Ewes with twins and triplets on board is are walking a, a tightrope with energy balance. Um, unfortunately, preg tox is a re relatively common disorder of the last six weeks of pregnancy, and not not just a disease of drought. During the last six weeks, the ewe has a very high energy requirement to provide for her own needs and, and that of the lambs, and her feed intake um, and the size of her rumen is dramatically reduced. So anything that tips the energy balance too severely, like um, bad, bad weather, um, will result in preg tox. So the first signs um, are dullness, loss of appetite and then that progresses to weakness and an inability to rise and then progressing on to the dull blindness and sitting there. It's a disease that we aim to prevent as cure of it is so difficult um, if you know verging on not not really possible sometimes. So this condition um, it's often confused with hypocalcemia or low calcium and they can occur concurrently. Um, a key difference is the response to treatment. So basically you get them early, give them the four in one flow pack and see if you get a response and, um, indicating it's hypocalcemia. So um, onto the problems ahead. So obviously after the difficult year um, with flies last summer, flies are going to be a major issue again this spring summer. So to understand fly control, it's important to understand um, that they don't just come in a big wave, that each season we grow our own strike flies. So the less season we have with the less sheep we have with strike, the less we're going to have, and the more we have with strike, the more we're going to have. So the pupa are found in the soil and hibernate there over winter from the last summer's fly problem. They start emerging from the soil in spring. The adult flies are attracted to the smell of the wet wool and lay their eggs, which become the maggots, which then um, molt and, and grow and eventually drop off and burrow back into the soil. So, um, you know, just as like with COVID, where one individual grows to two and two to four and so on, nipping it in the bud and keeping strike numbers low through your spring will hopefully ensure a better chance of you getting away for your Christmas break. But um, each year work, each year's work also further benefits the next year as well. So it's important that as much as possible we try to not let the maggots get back into the soil basically. So when you find them, then, uh, clip off the area of strike and place the maggoty wool in a, in a bag to kill the maggots. Um, preventing strike obviously also means preventing wet wool, so shearing, crutching, um, confirmation selection and prevention of scours are also all important. Um, if you're interested to see if you have emerging resistance issues, um, just like with worm testing, we can also test the maggots it, and it does cost, but um, it's available and the sample kits are available at the LLS office. Um, and also just like with worm control, the more we treat and for control and prevention of flies, the more we do select for resistance. Um, last year was probably the first year we started to notice that some chemicals that we have relied on for good control in recent years and now not working as well for as long. Um, and most importantly, this is in the class of dicyclinal or CLIC um, strike force. So it's important that you rotate your fly and lice treatment chemicals to select against resistance. So these are the key principles. You can't always obey them, but we still keep them in mind and we try. So they are, you know, use a different chemical for your lice control as you use for your fly control and use a different chemical for your fly dressing as you use for your fly prevention. 
and also rotate your chemical groups within the season if you need to use a prevention more than once and maximise your strategic control, obviously, so crutching, drenching, shearing, millsing um, to minimise chemical use. So what options does that leave us with um, for treatment and prevention options? Um, for treatment, we need to kill the maggots. And so in that category, we have ivermectin, which is that both fly and lice. We have extinosad or spinosad, uh, and we have a, a OPs, organophosphates, which obviously have their safety issues and you must um, wear gloves if using those. So um, if you don't have lice issues um, and you're not treating for lice, it becomes easier to, you know, meet these guidelines in doing your rotation as you've got more chemicals to rotate. <clears throat> but those who have been have lice issues and been treating for lice would possibly have been using piranha, which is um, same product, same class as Avenge and um, plus fly, which is imidacloprid um, or extinosad, spinosad to eradicate lice. They are also the products which not only don't have fly resistance, but they don't like lice are not resistant to those products either. So. If we've been relying a lot on click um, and we want to rotate away to a different chemical, just be aware of those drench classes that, I mean, sorry, um, uh, chemical classes that I've listed there and rotate to one that, don't rotate to one that's in the same um, group, like there's no point rotating from click to strike force because uh, that's not an effective rotation, it's the same class of chemical. Um, so instead, you know, we've got to look at going to, um, Avenge, Extinosad, Vanquish, for example. Um, so talk of fly strike. So talk of fly strike leads me on to, of course, the mulesing debate. We definitely need to be moving away from the need to mules, but moving too early or without adding in more strategic fly control is definitely not the best animal welfare move. So stopping mulesing takes advanced planning and action, starting with your ram selection and your ewe classing, and then also close observation at lamb marking. You could start by scoring 100 lambs yearly to assess your process using um, the breach assessments scoring um, tools. So you need a breach score, a breach wrinkle score below two to stop mulesing, and ideally some bare breach as well. The importance of a bare breach uh, in breach strike was investigated and it was found to be definitely less important than dags and wrinkle and skin wrinkles, but it does play an important part in exacerbating the effect of the wrinkles and dags. So you could start, um, I have heard of people starting their own trial and it's suggested that you could do this, you know, selecting 25 of your school, one and two lambs to see how they go. Just a word of warning that that can um, because then your non-mules to sheep do require extra st strategic crutching and fly treatments, they can get forgotten as part of the mob and this can end up being not such a, not such a great um, idea. So that leads me on, I also wanted to just uh, highlight the importance of pain relief at landmarking and just give you sort of an update of the options available. Uh, the more effective your pain relief, the better the lambs uh, are going to mother up and the less the stress and the setback of those lambs. The minimum pain relief is trisulfan, which is the local anaesthetic and antiseptic and hemorrhage control, which is sprayed onto the open wound. But the next layer, uh, uh, even better, is also using um, an anti-inflammatory, which is an injectable or oral uh, anti-inflammatory meloxicam, which is essentially like taking a Nurofen um, that lasts for three days. So you get three good days of pain relief from that. Uh, it's used in addition to trisulfan when mulesing is performed and it's used um, on its own instead when lambs are only marked and tail docked. Reports have been um, that, it, yeah, very people are very satisfied with it. Um, so yeah, as the weather warms, we need to be on the lookout for the building of all worms, but particularly barbers pole worm. Um, and it just may be that we need to add in earlier worm control than waiting for our traditional summer drench. Ideal conditions for barbers pole are warm, wet and short, short green pasture with daily average temperatures greater than 15 degrees. 
So monitoring and control leading into the spring is extremely important. Monitoring through the use of the faecal egg counts or worm egg count testing is better than monitoring through use of clinical signs, especially if um, that's death. Because uh, obviously once you've got death, you've had a severe anemia in the flock and it can take really a lot of months to recover from that. Um, note as well, of course, that clinical signs of, um, of barber's polar anemia and constipation uh, and death and you don't get any scouring. So uh, this worm also requires different management to that that we use for our scour worms in that we have to monitor more frequently with faecal egg counts, Re really recommended probably every four to six weeks. And we need to get in earlier in the spring, early summer with effective drenching to control pasture contamination and rapid escalation of worm numbers. So rotational grazing and effective drenching are really important tools in controlling this worm. So for treatment options, I need to highlight also that there's a high level of resistance to the white drenches and the mecton groups and a decreasing efficacy of clasantal as a um, long-acting. Uh, Abamec dual combines a mecton with long-acting clasantal and the dual active together seems to be still effective, um, but you won't get the, the length of activity out of it. Um, Cyvectin is a long-acting mectin formulation um, and unfortunately there's definitely demonstrated resistance developing so you definitely need to use it with a primer uh, and a tail cutter to reduce this development of resistance and keep it effective. In our area levamazole still seems to work well um, so used in combination um, either in triples or is to prime your long actings it's, it's a good option. Uh, other newer drenches, well, not so new anymore, but you know, monopantal Zolvix uh, and your combinations like QTEC and your um, StarTech, the Quantil and Abmectin, are really great options. So you use these options when you're drenching and moving to clean pastures. Um, remember that there's also the option of Barbavac, the, the vaccination against Barbas control, Barbas pole, but you need to start with your lambs now. Um, so any high production pastures and crops are going to be a really high risk for pulpy kidney this spring. Pulpy kidney is caused by <clears throat> circumstances which result in uh, abnormally high growth of the normal gut clostridial bacteria and the clostridial toxin. Uh, it's associated with rapid changes of diet but also you know your high energy diets. So rapidly growing weaned and unweaned lambs are going to be a highest risk, especially those on lush pastures or cereal crops. Um, the animals are found dead or convulsing and die quickly and it affects your best lambs. So it's prevented through your five in one vaccine. To be boosted effectively, they need to have their two initial injections, um, your one at lamb marking and then your one four to six or four to eight weeks later. Um, in high risk situations, you should boost it every three months and your vaccination of your ewes pre-lambing will protect your lambs until lamb marking. So uh, pulpy kidney can also be controlled by adding more fibre into the diet, uh, <clears throat> but most more importantly by avoiding sudden diet changes. Um, the most important point that you may or may, not, may or may not be doing is just making sure that you've given that um, initial booster of that um, initial protection and not being afraid to give extra boosters to maximise the protection of your young stock. You can't over vaccinate with it. Um, so on to, yeah, just to mention feet. Uh, this winter was actually very cold and so despite the wet, we actually had quite minimal, um, for a lot of people, quite minimal feet issues. But now with the daily average temperature getting above 10 degrees um, and still very moist pasture conditions, we're in an ideal foot rot spread period. Our benign foot rot as well as our virulent foot rot is going to be expressing to a maximum amount. Um, remember virulent foot rot is notifiable. You, um, the, so the same bacteria, Dicheolobacter nodosus causes benign foot rot, low virulent foot rot and high virulent foot rot. And, there are many, many different strains with variable of powers, amounts of power to underrun the heel. Um, and flocks from our, you know, large amount of surveillance we've been doing are either not infected with any um, foot rot bacteria or infected with multiple strains 
from benign through to virulent. So um, there's a lot around it. Foot rot involves the underrunning of the hoof at the heel. I put this photo in here to demonstrate that. Um, and when we get chronic lameness and production losses, if you have underrunning of the heel, it's time to call the district vet so that we can come and have a look at the sheep, look at the proportion that are affected and you know, work out a usually a foot bathing plan and an eradication plan in the long term and it, it, to determine if it's benign or if it's virulent and what the best options are. So, um, you know, on prevention, um, especially with restocking, take great care when restocking that you don't buy foot rot in. Um, keep uh, any variety of foot rot, we don't want any variety. Keep any new sheep that you have purchased isolated from the rest of your flock until the end of spring. Ensure your boundary fencing is good and you've checked, um, you always check the feet on strays. Uh, foot bathing is a very effective management tool. So zinc sulfate is um, most frequently used and best chemical to use. We use it at 10 to, 10 to 20 percent, um, but uh, where we used to use formalin, it, it's not safe to use. It was used as a walkthrough um, situation, but zinc sulfate requires a little bit more contact time, ideally with say five minutes. But try if, they, if you're walking them through, try and make sure that your wraiths um, and foot baths are at least eight metres long and that the sheep are walking through slowly. It's the, the wetting and the drying effect that achieves it. So you also need to put sheep into a... Um, an environment where those, that zinc sulfate can dry onto the onto the feet. Um, it can also, if you're having issues, um, zinc sulfate can be made more effective by uh, and given greater penetration by using it with a detergent, um, which is sodium lauryl sulfate at one to two percent, and you can get that along with the the um, zinc sulfate from your rural suppliers. So we're on to questions now. So I'm going to just um, stop sharing my screen. So yeah, con please contact me if you've got any um, additional questions or we'll feed them and um, type your questions into the question box now. I'll just stop sharing and then... Uh, That's back on Marion's screen now. Alex, uh, yes, should be all, all good. All good, thank you. Uh, yeah, there we go. Um, thanks, Alex, that, and thanks, thanks um, Matt and Phil also, that was excellent. Um, yes, so if I could just ask you to turn your cameras back on. Um, Phil, we might try your camera and um, just see how we, see how we track with that. Um, thank you. Excellent. Um, can I just remind um, everybody if they do have any questions to type them into the chat box um, and we will possibly not get to them all, um, in which case um, we will circulate the questions with responses in an email after this webinar. So thank you um, to the speakers. I'll just um, read through these questions and, um, and direct them accordingly. Um, so Matt, there's a couple there for you to start with. Um, Will the farming forecast to cover any areas on the south coast in the future? Yeah, thanks, Marin. Um, the answer, the short answer is yes. Um, we're definitely looking at that. One of the issues initially um, is that grass grow doesn't handle C4 or, or, tr or tropical species um, very well. So there's, there's some work being done at the moment to um, to, to rectify that. Um, and so once that happens, we'll then be able to expand um, grass grow across to sort of coastal regions and and um, further north where tropical species are um, a dominant. So yeah, the answer is yes. Um, it, we are certainly looking at it. Excellent, thank you. Um, another one for you, Matt. Um, so if you're unable to crash graze due to small stock numbers, is slashing a consideration? Yeah, good question. We we get this um, quite quite a lot. Um, yes, I guess slashing can be a very useful tool um, in helping to manage paddocks or, or, or try and get paddocks that have become overgrown and try and get them back into some sort of order. Um, the catch with slashing though is that what tends to happen is that we get a concentration of um, material in 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 narrow windrows, which then smothers 
the pasture um, underneath. So um, I guess there are different types of mowers out there. Some some spread the material um, more evenly than others and, and chop it up more. Um, so they, they're going to be a bit better suited. But if you've got a if you've got a slasher that does really tend to concentrate a, a pretty heavy windrow. Um, you're just going to be very, very careful with that, and you might need to adjust your cutting height um, and do do multiple passes over, you know, a number of over over a, a period of time to gradually try and get 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 that paddock back into some sort of shape. Matt, Matt if I can just um, add add there, I think the important thing if you use a slasher is to start early. Um, as Matt highlighted, if it's really tall and you're trying to bring that down, you can end up just creating a thatch over the top. Whereas if you start early, uh, to control the amount you're putting back onto the pasture is a lot smaller and you have none of those effects. So slashing works, but it's a it's the same principle as as using livestock. You've got to start early. If you let it get away from you and then try to pull it back through the grazing or, or slashing or mechanical means, it just doesn't work as well. Yeah, and I guess um, also Phil is by going early. Um, I think it's a really good point because the material that you actually put, you know, the material you actually cut in, because it's going to be of higher quality, it's going to break down quicker. Yep. Whereas if you go in late in the season and start trying to slash, you know, rank poor quality material, that material is just going to take you know a long, long, long time to to break down. Excellent, thank you. Um, Matt, another one for you. What supplements do you suggest for weaners? Um, yeah, OK. I think on the slide um, I had down some, some rough rules of thumb for weaners. So a, a minimum of a sort of 11 megajoules of energy and about 13% protein for weaners. Um, it's, yes, and I guess, so I think you can use a whole range of, of products. It really probably just comes down to what what you're set up to actually handle. Um, so you could use if you're more better set up for a for a, for a hay, um, then you could use say a, a good legume based hay, whether it's a, a clover hay or a loosened hay, um, or maybe vetch. If you're able to handle concentrates, i.e. grain and pellets and that sort of thing, there are a lot of different options out there. Um, you know, lots of different pellets. You just need to make sure that they've got enough energy and protein. So just try and work on that a minimum of 11 megs of energy and about 13% protein. Um, yeah, is, what, is what, what I'd really be looking at. Thanks, Matt. Um, next question I suggest would be for Phil. Um, do the land prices, land price changes reflect supply? Oh. Phil, I think you muted there. If you're looks like you're talking, yeah. thanks. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. Look, supply supply does play um, you know, a role in those in those prices. So um, you got to try and think back of what the what the years were like and when when things come into play um, to try and and give people an indication across most years. The the high to low point is it maxes out at about fifteen percent. Um, um, unfortunately, uh, you don't quite get the consistency. Um, you know, in in the 2021, um, the lowest price is most likely going to be uh, um, early early this year, and the highest price will have will have been in April in August, and then it, then it'll drop off a bit. Um, I think the thing to bear in mind they they don't they don't drop massively, so. Provided your weight gains are good enough, often you will put enough weight on to increase the value of the stock you're dealing with. Great, thank you. Um, the question from Anne, would you suggest you had loosened to graze in spring and make hay in summer off that paddock? Not sure who, Matt, did you want to have a go at that one? I'll I'll have an initial go and Phil Phil might um, come in. I think I don't know. I suppose it depends on on really what the purpose for, um, of the of the high is um, and what what you're going to use it for down the track. I'd be I'd almost be tempted to to try and cut cut the hay in spring and then use that paddock perhaps for weaners to go on to 
um, if if that sort of suits your system and your your lambing sort of this time of the year. Um, but in saying that, I think with the way the forecast is cutting hay this spring is going to be quite challenging with with the weather. So yeah, I don't. I'm not really 100% sure on which way to go there. Matt, I think you've got to be flexible. Um, it just purely purely because of potentially the way the season's going to be. Um, as I said before in my talk, I think the, the, the ability to cut quality early is going to be very low. So I'd almost be starting off with the thinking that I'm going to, I'm going to graze the loosen um, and then uh, potentially look at if we do get sort of uh, November, December rains and we get a good response for the loosen, uh, taking those cuts and turning them into hay when when the temperatures will be helping you make a quality upgrades to start off with and and cut later. If if we're looking at a totally different season, I could turn that around. So I've made I've made that sort of pitch on the basis that we, we're heading into a wet a wet summer, early December, a wet spring, uh, early early a wet spring and a wet early summer. Great, thank you. Um, I might skip down. There's there's quite a few questions for you, Alex. So I might skip to some of those um, now. Uh, what are the general wind, rain, temperature levels to look out for that will risk harming young lambs? Uh, yeah, well, I would just um, <laughs> take a step outside. Uh, yeah, no, it's like sorry. Um, the Exact ones. Um, I think it's really you need to just you can Google those um, like wind wind chill charts. And I think that what we had this winter was really just it was the excessive rain and then excessive wind combination. It's always the wind rain combination that is the hardest. Like when they get saturated and then the wind blows. And and that was the problem with the, our little lambs. Like you know lambs are born with a reserve. Um, but you can't expect them to handle, you, you know, and that reserve lasts them for the 24 hours until they can have a good feed from mum. Um, if mum, uh, yeah, if, if, but with wind chill factors like that, they're really only going to last a couple of hours and that's what happened. Thanks, Alex. Um, can I just add good. there that, that on farming forecaster now, the, the wind, the wind chill factor in the, is, is there every day if there's a uh, if the conditions are such that lambs are, will be put under stress, it appears down in the weather component of farming forecaster. So um, it's there for anyone to be able to get on and look at. Excellent, great, that's really useful. Thanks, Phil. Um, might just squeeze a couple more in. Um, Alex, should we use pain relief if we cut the lamb's tails? Are rings a better option for tailing? Uh, I, I think the hot hot gas guns are the best option, and yeah, and combined with um, pain relief, yeah, it's it's the whole pain relief thing. It's it's really just um, we're always improving our standards, and I think it's about like looking in the long term and and going. These products are available now, um, and what do we feel comfortable with and even you know in New South Wales they actually haven't made it mandatory to use pain relief but yet most producers do uh, and then I, I think in some way some producers are feeling frustrated about they're already using trisulfan and now they're being asked to use another pain relief as well I don't think they're being asked to use I think they're being offered another pain relief and uh, as well and and um, I've you know heard it sort of described as if you go to the dentist, you know, you get a local to get your tooth out, but you do you also reach for that Panadol for that couple of days afterwards as well. And it's just that multi-layering of pain relief to give you the best, best pain relief. And yeah, so as as time goes on, I think we just have better and better options to to have available to us. So um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's a personal choice, um, and people generally feel really better with themselves using the pain relief. Um, but yeah, it, it's definitely a choice. Thanks, Alex. Um, it might be time to call it at that. It looks like we've we've come to the end of our time. Um, I was going to try and squeeze a few more in, but I don't think that's realistic. Um, so would 
um, just like to make a couple of points. And one is that um, that Matt is able to um, to email the PowerPoint presentation um, out to you all, um, and you will also receive a recording of the presentation. Um, and just wanted to thank you, all, thank you for your time today, and to thank the speakers for their presentation, uh, and to let you know there will be a short survey as you leave leave the webinar just with two quick questions, so we'd really appreciate your feedback on that. Um, so thank you all very much for your time today. Thank you speakers, um, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.